from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoiced to see that found Let's go ahead and take our seats as we prepare to worship the Lord together. So this passage highlights God forgiveness. And I thought what a great passage to praise the Lord with. Amen. So please hear the words of the Lord. It comes from 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Father of grace, we praise you for providing forgiveness for our sins, past, present, and future. We praise you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who was a willing sacrifice. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for choosing to lay down your life to pay the penalty of sin there is no greater expression of love. And now those who trust in you have 
joyful fellowship with not only you, but with the Father, the Holy Spirit, and with all of us who are trusting in you for salvation. And Holy Spirit, as we abide in Christ, convince us to confess our sins quickly. Those that were done by accident and on purpose, those in private and in public, those that are against you and others, help us know that holding on to them and hiding them will only hinder, will only hurt our fellowship with you and others. And may we remember that when we do confess our sins, Christ is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, God, for these glorious realities. Amen. Well, let's stand together and praise our Savior by singing about his beautiful, wonderful love. Here we go. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love, too vast and astounding to tell. Forever existing in a world above, now offered and given to all. O fountain of beauty eternal, the Father, the Spirit, the Son, sufficient and endlessly generous. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Creation is brimming with thankfulness. The mountains exultant they stand. The seasons rejoice in your faithfulness. All life is sustained by your hand. You crown every meadow with color You paint every shade in the sky Each day the dawn wakes as an encore of Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love How great, how sure His love is What grace that you entered our brokenness You came in the fullness of time How far we had fallen from righteousness But not from the mercies of Christ Your cross is our door to redemption Your death is our fullness of life that day, how forgiveness flowed as a flood. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how sure His love endures forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. your resurrection you lift us to infinite heights could anything sever or take us from magnificent marvelous matchless love how great how sure his love is So we'll sing this first verse twice. Sing this with me. How I love the voice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. 
He declares his work is finished. He has spoken this hope to me. Though the sun had ceased its shining, though the war appeared as lost, Christ had triumphed over evil. It was finished upon that cross. Sing that again. How I love the voice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. He declares his work is finished. He has spoken this whole to me. Though the sun had ceased its shining, though the war appeared as lost, Christ had triumphed. Was finished upon that cross. Yeah. Now the curse it has been broken. Jesus paid the price for me, for the pardon he has offered. Great the welcome that I receive. Boldly I approach my Father, clothed in Jesus' righteousness. There is no more guilt to carry. It was finished upon that cross. my great opponent fear once had a hold on me but the son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed sing that again death was once my great opponent death was once my great opponent Fear once had a hold on me, but the Son who died to save us rose that we would be free indeed. Yes, He rose that we would be free indeed. Free from every plan of darkness, free to live and free to love. Death is dead and Christ finished upon that cross onward to eternal glory to my savior and my god i rejoice in jesus victory it was finished upon that cross it was finished upon that cross it was finished upon that cross Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 136. And we're going to do it a little bit differently this morning. We're going to do it as a responsive reading because I think that's how it was intended to be read. Um, I will say the first line of each verse and then you guys will respond with the, the last line of, of the verse, uh, which is, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Every verse uh, concludes with those words. They should be colored uh, on the screen behind me so you can see uh, what you will say. But let me encourage you. Because you're going to say the same, you're going to say the same thing 26 times. <laughs> Let me encourage you that uh, this not just become mindless repetition for you. Um, this is not meant to be mindless repetition. This is meant 
This is divinely inspired repetition. This is something that the Holy Spirit intends for you to reflect upon and think about and then give thanks to him. That's the, the call of this psalm is to give thanks to him because his, his loving kindness is everlasting. So let's read through this now together. Psalm 136. Give thanks to Yahweh for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who alone does great wonders. For his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the heavens with skill. For his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights, For his loving kindness is everlasting. the sun to rule by day, For his loving kindness is everlasting. the moon and stars to rule by night, For his loving kindness is everlasting. to him who smote the Egyptians in their firstborn, For his loving kindness is everlasting. and brought Israel out from their midst. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm. For his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. For his loving kindness is everlasting. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. For his loving kindness is everlasting. But he overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. For his loving kindness is To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who smote great kings, For his loving kindness is everlasting. and slew mighty kings, For his loving kindness is everlasting. Sihon, king of the Amorites, For his loving kindness is everlasting. and Og, king of Bashan, For his loving kindness is everlasting. and gave their land as a heritage, For his loving kindness is everlasting. even a heritage to Israel his servant. Who remembered us in our low estate. For his loving kindness is everlasting. And has rescued us from our adversaries. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Who gives food to all flesh. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of heaven. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this wonderful truth that your loving kindness is everlasting. You have shown us a love which is beyond comprehension, a love which we did not deserve and we never deserved. You loved us even though we hated you, even though we were your enemies, and even though we continue even to struggle with sin today, you continue to love us and, you, and your love will endure forever. Lord, this is the foundation of our hope. If if your love could change or falter in any way, we would lose all hope. So may we never fall into the trap of thinking that, that your love is contingent upon what we do. May we never think that it is up to us to earn your love or to maintain your love for us. Father, we thank you that your love is unchanging and that you are unchanging. In this, we rejoice And for this, we give you thanks and we give you praise. Father, we ask that you would open our eyes this morning as we continue to study Proverbs. Help Paul to communicate your word clearly, and we pray that your spirit would continue to give us understanding. Help us to respond with faith and humility so that we might grow in wisdom and bring honor to your name. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, just as the Lord Yahweh set Israel apart from the rest of the world. We can expect that in following Christ, the world will despise and even forsake us. But praise the Lord that he will never forsake us. Let's stand together and sing. Here we go. Jesus, I my cross have taken All to leave and follow Thee 
destitute, despised, forsaken. Thou from hence my all shall be. Perish every fond ambition, all I've sought or hoped or known. Yet how rich is my condition, God and heaven are still my. Let the world despise and leave me. They have left my Savior too. Human hearts and looks deceive me. Thou art not like them untrue. Oh, while thou dost smile upon Spirit dwells within thee. Think what Father smiles are thine. Think that Jesus died to win thee. Child of heaven, canst thou repine? Praise be on from grace to glory, armed by faith and weak by prayer. Heaven's eternal days before thee, God's own hand shall guide us there. Soon shall close thy earthly. Soon shall pass thy pilgrim days. Hope shall change to glad fruition. Faith to sight and prayer to praise. That's our hope.
Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages to thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour. At your feet it's treasure store. Take myself and I will take our Bibles this morning. We are in Proverbs chapter 1, studying the book of Proverbs together. We've been going uh, word by word, sometimes syllable by syllable, but we're going we're gonna to pick up considerably today and, um, and over the next number of weeks. Solomon begins to move into the lesson portion of Proverbs, meaning he, he begins to teach a series of lessons and and this one today, he, right after the introduction, we've been looking at the prologue, verses 1 through 8. And now he says, pull up your chair. We need to have a conversation. And we need to talk about your friends. Yes, your friends. We need to talk about the voices that you listen to, the counsel that you receive, the friends that are in your life, the people that are influencing you. We need to talk about them. And we need to address a few things And he does that not from the standpoint of an adversary. He does that as a father. He addresses his son. Uh, This could be written to daughters as well. This could be written to anyone who has an ear to hear, who wants to listen to the voice of wisdom. We need to talk about the company you keep. Now, now you don't have to be a believer to to realize that friends influence us and voices of of others and counsel influences us. We see that all around us. That's, That's not anything new. 
Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's even in uh, the literature of the world. If you go back to the 16th century with Don Quixote, before I learned phonics, it was Don Quixotex. Uh, but Don Quixote, uh, his trusty companion, Sancho, he, he says uh, to him, the proverb is right. Tell me your company and I will tell you what you are. The, the Greek tragedy, Euripides, or again, phonics, Euripides, um, 406 BC, this is an old idea. He said, every man is like the company he is prone to keep. So tell me who your friends are and I will tell you who you are and what you're like and the kind of things that you like and the kind of circles that you travel in. And this is what we find in our text. There are many windows into the human heart. And we're going to see a lot of different ones in Proverbs. We're going to see that uh, the words that we use, that's a window into the, your heart. It tells us what's there. Jesus said that, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, we're going to see that it's the works that we do. It's the, the attachments that we have. It's the things where we place our money and, and give our best intellectual thoughts and, and thinking uh, applied to. It's, it's those kind of things. That, those are windows into the heart. But here, Solomon is saying, here's another window that we're going to look into today, and it's your friends. It's the people that are influencing you. And maybe you're the friend on the other side of this that Solomon is actually warning against. He's also warning against certain kinds of friends. And maybe, just maybe, you're one of those friends that's wrongly or uh, influencing someone in an ungodly way. These are windows into the human heart. We, we need to be aware of this. Solomon says, look at the friends we keep, which is more than just a social group. This is not just the friends we hang out with. As we said, this is the counsel that we receive. These are the, this is the wisdom, the perceived wisdom of the world and other factors that we listen to, the counsel that we follow, the loudest voices that are in our lives, the things that maybe stir up our hearts in certain ways. We watch certain things on TV. We watch certain news reports, and, and it stirs us up, and we're easily influenced by these kind of things. Well, if you remember last week, verse 7, we said, is the most important verse in all the Proverbs. Verse 7 is, and, and you see it there, that the fear of Yahweh, this is wisdom. This is where it all begins. Verse 7, it reveals the overarching pattern of Proverbs, and, it's, and it comes down to two things. Either we are living under the banner of the fear of Yahweh, the, the who God is, His truth, and the worship of Him, or we're living a life of foolishness. That's really it. I wish there was a third way, but there's not. Uh, there's, there's two patterns here that Solomon is just going to go back to again and again, bounce back and forth between here's what the fear of the Lord looks like and here's what a fool looks like. Here's what the fear of Yahweh and walking with him looks like and all of these different things. And then here's what a fool looks like. He's just going to bounce back and forth through these all throughout 31 chapters of Proverbs. Everyone lines up under one of these two worldviews. And, and these are the flags that fly over your life, one or the other. And we're immediately thrust into a scenario here where the fear of Yahweh is not on display. Solomon needs to warn his son. Uh, son, I've been noticing some things and, and I need you to listen to me. So sons today, would you listen? Young men, boys, old men, would you listen carefully? Solomon is talking to you. Now the rest of you are thinking, great, I can just tune out. No, he's, he's talking to all of us. Because all Scripture is inspired by God and all of it's profitable for instruction. So even if you do not count yourself as a son in the literal sense, he is speaking to us. None of us are obviously a son of Solomon, but we are all here receiving Scripture. And we are in the position of the recipient. We are in the position of the son that he is speaking to here. And we're in this scenario where the fear of Yahweh is not on display. I've been seeing some things, and we come away from verse 7, and Solomon shows us how easy it is to compromise when it comes to the fear of Yahweh. It was so clear last week, right? I mean, I like to think it was clear. Um, you know, but the passage was really clear, right? Even if the sermon wasn't. Uh, the passage is unmistakably clear. It shows us what the fear of Yahweh is. You just keep reading, and you see it over and over again. It's everywhere in Scripture. And yet we come away, and immediately, in verse 8, there's a problem. Immediately. Here, here's a, a place where it's so easy to compromise on 
knowing the Lord and what it means. And so here's another aspect that we see. Verse 7, the fear of Yahweh, that's really showing us how we relate to God. And then we think about verses 8 through 19 is really how we relate to others. This sounds a lot like the, the Ten Commandments, doesn't it? The, the, the Decalogue, where the first table is how we relate to God. The second table is how we relate to others. And you have both of these here. And it, that order is really important. So in other words, uh, we don't want to move too quickly to verses 8 through 19, which is what we're going to look at today. You really need to meditate on, think about verse 7. Well, what we have here in our passage in verses 8 through 19 is really one main lesson in three parts. You with me? One main lesson in three parts. And, and these three parts are sections that are divided up over the, the course of uh, three addresses to his son. And he'll, in fact, he'll address his son three times here. These are three lessons that help us discern our relationship to others. And so even if you're no longer a young son in the home or you're in a, a different position in life, this is still for us. And these are three abiding lessons that will help us discern our relationship to others in light of verse 7, in light of walking in the fear of Yahweh, to worship Him and to know Him by His truth. Uh, the first one we come to, the first lesson is in verses 8 and 9. It is this, embrace the means of wisdom. Embrace the means of wisdom. Look at verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. At first, you need to understand a little bit about the lay of the land, how, how this sets up. And what we, we have here, we're listening to the father instruct his son. And uh, over the first nine chapters, there's going to be 11 distinct lessons that Solomon is going to deliver to his sons. 11 times he will begin a new subject and he'll talk to his sons uh, these 11 times with 11 distinct lessons. And occasionally, uh, a few times, there will be a, a, a lady who will break into the room and we're going to call her Lady Interlude. Uh, she is a voice of wisdom. There's, not all, there's other ladies we're going to meet in Proverbs. They're not always wise, but this is the voice of wisdom. And she'll break in with song just to give Solomon a break. He'll take a breath and she'll sing about the joys of wisdom. And, and she'll say, listen to me, I'm calling out to you. And that's really how these first nine chapters set up. There's 11 lessons from Solomon to his son and with an occasional interlude that breaks in. You're going to see all of that here in chapter one. We'll have a uh, a lesson, and then we'll have a, an interlude as well, and so on. But, but this is the, the lay of the land. The, the dad is leading here. The father is leading. But notice, both parents are agents of God's wisdom for their children. Uh, this is not consigned to just one parent. This is for both parents. And, and so let's, let's break this down a little bit as we talk about embracing the means of wisdom. Look at what this looks like here in verse 8. First of all, it's a position to listen. I need to be in position to listen, right? And the position that he speaks to here is not even the family relationship first of being a son or a daughter. Actually, the position is, very, is that very thing. It's listening. In fact, the first word in verse 8 in the original is shema. And you know if you've been listening and studying Proverbs, that's a really important word, not only in Proverbs, but in all the Old Testament. The John 3.16 of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. This is important. This is foundational. And oftentimes, the, writer of the, the writers of the Old Testament, in order to begin a new series or a section or to gain attention, they'll say, Shema, listen. And that's exactly what he does here. It's the first word out of his mouth. Listen. Now, there's a, a misnomer, and we addressed this a few weeks ago, about Solomon. When Solomon was uh, coming into the throne of Israel, uh, don't answer out loud because I, I don't want to. Um, uh, 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 I don't want anybody to feel weird about this because uh, for the longest time I thought when Solomon came to the throne of Israel, what did he ask for? He asked for wisdom. Not so fast. He actually didn't. He didn't ask for wisdom at all. God gave him wisdom. But if you study the text carefully, we looked at this a few weeks ago in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. He doesn't say, give me wisdom, Lord. He says, give your servant a listening, a hearing heart. That's what he asked for. And in response to that, the Lord gave him wisdom right? And, and the Lord blessed him beyond his days and years and education and everything else. And in spite of himself, it was all an act of God's grace. 
Some of you are flipping back to see if that's actual, uh, if that's true. You're good Bereans. But, but Lord, give me a listening heart. Give me a listening heart. That's what he prayed for. Lord, is my heart in position to hear what I need to hear? I want you to notice how that word actually frames this entire chapter. If you look back at verse 5, we looked at this already. Uh, in the course of wisdom, what is it? A wise man will shema. A wise man will hear. Look at the very end of the chapter, verse 33. But he who shema listens, he who hears, he is the one. She is the one who will dwell securely. It, it is to know God with a teachable heart, a listening heart. This is the position of wisdom. You've got to be in position to listen. Are you ready to listen? Now, a lot of times we know this in parenting. We know this from our own hearts. Uh, We can actually audibly hear something but not be listening, right? We can hear the words that our wife is saying. We can hear the words that our parents are saying, and and we can hear those words, and the, the, uh, the physical sensation of those words are bouncing around in our ears and off muscles and drums and all of those kind of things. And we can hear the words. Did you hear what I said? Yes, I heard what you said. But then there's that follow-up question. But are you listening? Right? What do we mean by that? We mean, are you ready to obey? Are you ready to to listen with a humble heart? That's what he's saying here. Think about this. It really takes no discipline. It takes no wisdom. It takes no effort not to listen. Uh, You just show up and just keep doing what you've been doing. This is the primary reason, as we're going to see in Proverbs, that the fool is spoken of as lazy. Now, when we think of somebody being lazy, we think of this is somebody who won't get out of their bed and won't work. He, he'll address that too. But the fool is, is, is fundamentally and foundationally lazy, not because he won't finish tasks, but because he refuses fundamentally to listen. That's more foundational. Hear my Son, the, the Hebrew word there is a word you probably know. You know the name Ben. We have, by my counting, about eight or nine Bens and Benjamins in our, in our church. Uh, ben means son. Uh, Benjamin is son of my right hand. It's usually Ben of something, and it'll, it'll be attached to that. But the word Ben means son. And it's important here because it frames these first nine chapters. Fifteen times in the first nine chapters. Sixty times in the book of Proverbs. So he's going to go to this again and again and again. This is the rhetorical vehicle that Solomon is going to use for delivering wisdom to us. In other words, we're getting to to peer over and look over the shoulder of Solomon as he addresses, addresses his sons. As readers, it is the son who is in our position. We are the ones who need to listen to what this father has to say. Now, our circumstances are certainly different than life in the kingdom of Israel in the 900s B.C., right? But the hearts are the same. No matter where you go, the issues are the same. The labels change, but the issues remain the same. You don't have to be a literal son to listen. You just need to be in a position to listen with with a teachable heart. That's what he's saying here. So embracing the means of wisdom begins here. Secondly, and just breaking this down a little bit further, it also means a people to hear a people to hear. Here's where we start to see some of the differences in in the types of wisdom that we receive. He's saying there's some foundational places and roles that need to be speaking into your life. Here he says in the second part of verse 8, my father's or your father's instruction and your mother's teaching. Your father's instruction. Um, We we saw this same word, father's instruction. We saw that same word instruction back in verse 2. That's a purpose of of all the Proverbs, to know wisdom and instruction. So it's to know it, to know the truth. Verse 3, we also see to receive instruction. So it's, it's knowing it and receiving it. And here he says, now you need to know, you need to listen to your father's instruction, the, the wisdom that God is giving by his word. Now this word here refers instruction. It refers to disciplined training. It, it encompasses many things. It's not just one thing. It's warnings. It's, it's exhortations. It's all kinds of teachings. We, we don't want to overstate what the importance of this word by itself, but it encompasses all sorts of things. But what you have here, fathers, it, it is an established pattern for dads. The father's pattern of instilling wisdom, notice it's not characterized by coercive force, but by instructional guidance. 
It's not always because I said so. It's because this is right. Here is the path for truth. Here is the path of wisdom. Now, all of us who are fathers here, and I'm speaking to myself, we, we all struggle with this kind of teaching because uh, I, I'm very aware that uh, as my children were growing up, I didn't want their first name or them to think that their first name was no, right? Uh, whatever the question is, the answer is no. I, I, no, actually, there needs to be instruction. There needs to be guidance. There needs to be cause and effect. There needs to be a little bit of the letting out of the rope to, to let them see at times within the bounds of safety, not purposefully endangering them all the time, uh, but letting them live a little bit and letting them see some of the, the ends of those things. That's instilling instruction. That's instilling wisdom, and it's characterizing the Father's approach. There's, there's so much incredibly bad teaching when it comes to fatherhood these days. And, and I'm not just talking about the stuff that's out in the world. I'm talking about the stuff that's invading the church that I think starts in the world and people start to adopt it. There's just a lot of garbage. There's a lot of stupid teaching. That's the word that Solomon would use in Proverbs. And what we're going to do, we can't address all of that today. We're just going to begin to chip away at some of those things because fatherhood is so important, so foundational in all the books of Pro- in all the chapters of Proverbs. So is motherhood. But we're going to see how foundational the role of fathers in setting the tone and setting the direction and setting the care for their homes. And there's just a lot of stuff that we're up against. And Solomon's going to address it here. And Solomon will speak from the standpoint of what he sees in the world, but I have to believe what he also sees in his own heart on his best days, not not all those wicked evil days, but on his best days, he understands the frailties of his own heart and his need for wisdom. There's just a lot of bad stuff out there. And there seems to be, a lot of it is categorized, we maybe think of it in two ditches. One is to underplay uh, fatherhood as something that is unnecessary. In fact, it just becomes not needed at all in certain discussions, that you can actually get along without that and, and without that kind of uh, leadership and instruction and mentorship and, and fathering. You, it's just unnecessary. You, you see that conversation being had. Another side of this, and this is where I see it more and more in the church, is to make an idol of fatherhood. Are you with me? Uh, This is where the importance of the father is overstated in unbiblical ways as if everything hinges on what the father does in the home. That's not the case. In Proverbs chapter 1, the foundation is laid to help us see the goal of parenting and especially being a father. It's not to control our children or to have them always under our thumb. Part of that teaching is, that false teaching is that fathers are priests and kings of their home. No, you're not. No, you're not. That's nowhere in Scripture. That's a, that's a false teaching, and it's invading churches. I see it every day, and it has disastrous effects. We're not the chief priests. We're not the kings of our homes. Actually, what we are as fathers, as husbands, we are to be the chief servants, right? We, we are to be the chief servants. We are to show what servanthood looks like. We are to show that in our words and our actions and all that we do, and, and we're all indicted as soon as I say that, including myself. Jesus did not have the whip and overturning tables at the centerpiece of his ministry. That was two occasions. And I think some fathers will quickly go to that and say, this is how you lead. That's not how you lead. Not only that, Jesus was perfectly righteous in his anger. What's at the center of Jesus' ministry is a cross. What is at the center of Jesus' ministry leading to the cross is a basin and a towel. It's humility. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He laid down his life for her, right? That's to be the character and quality of our ministry in the home. He also says, do not forsake, don't reject, don't abandon your mother's teaching. Literally uses the word Torah here. Don't forsake mom's laws. But it's more than just laws here. It's actually a a wonderful word. The word Torah, it's direction, it's decisions. Another bad teaching that's out there is that the dad, the father, the husband, he makes all the decisions in the home. Not so fast. Right here you see moms making decisions, giving wisdom, giving direction to the children and to the home. It was Churchill's wife who said, uh, Winston Churchill's wife said the, the 
husband is the head, but it's the woman who turns the neck, right? You see that influence, the influence of a godly mother, the influence of a godly woman pouring into her children. In this case, it's the sons. Sons, you are a fool to reject that. So what we see here is a couple of things. Wisdom is not native. It's not inborn. It's not natural to us. It actually comes, and we've been seeing this again and again, and we're going to continue to see it. It comes by external means of instruction, of teaching. And here the external means are the parents. It's godly influences. It's all of this. Now, this does not mean that your children cannot have other teachers. That's, again, another false teaching that has invaded the church, that only I can teach my children, only I can give them direction. They must always sit under me in every class, in every instance, and in everything. That, that's just a bad teaching. I'm glad to see a lot of you are not practicing that, even right now, because you're under another teacher. In fact, I, I want my sons and daughters, I want my sons and daughters to learn to train their ears toward others who speak truth and have wisdom. We need that. And still, we also recognize something else here that might open up a whole other discussion by just reading verse 8, and that is this. Some of you are very cognizant of the fact that you never had or don't have a wise and godly mother or father. Some grew up without that. Uh, some came out of homes that were homes of unbelief. And, and here's a beautiful thing about the body of Christ. We need godly wisdom, mature voices, sound counsel, tried and tested instruction, and God in His grace gives us that in a believing community. For sure, we are thankful for our parents, even if they're unbelievers, and yet we see the need for godly mentors, those wise voices who will speak into our lives. That's, that's in Scripture. You read Titus 2, and, and Paul is writing Titus to Titus, who's at Crete. Crete is a Roman colony. It's uh, deep in paganism and all sorts of other things, and, you, and it's believed a lot of the people that would have come into the church there in Crete would have come out of those pagan backgrounds. They came from unbelieving homes, and now they find themselves in Christ, and, and very uh, possibly a lot like Timothy. They may have a believing parent and an unbelieving parent, and yet they can turn to those mature voices in the church, and you see that in Titus 2 where you see the importance of godly, mature relationships, older men, older women, pouring into the younger men and the younger women of the church. That's needed. Be thankful for what the Lord has done for you, and yet be grateful, even if you don't have believing parents or what Solomon is describing here. The Lord has more than abundantly given us that by His church. There's a lot of practical wisdom here that we're just going to have to return to in, in the days to come. But what we see is that the biblical path of parenting, and you're going to see this, it begins here, but we'll just watch it very closely. Solomon is in neither camp of totally immersing our kids in the cult world and the culture, but he's also not into totally isolating them either. You understand? And, and it takes a lot of wisdom to understand the difference. There are times where he's going to say, do not go there. You need to be wise. You should not even step your foot there. And there's other times where Solomon loads up his sons in the chariot and they drive through some pretty seedy parts of town. And he uses that as an object lesson. You're going to see all of that in Proverbs. We've we got to understand the, the wisdom of not immersing our children totally into the world, but not isolating them from it either. How do we do that? It's faithful instruction and teaching borne out over the course of a child's life. Notice finally here under this first lesson, it's a payment to consider, a payment to consider. Verse 9, indeed, this wisdom from your, your parents, this, this godly wisdom that's poured into you, whatever the channel may be, indeed, it is a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. I was in Hobby Lobby yesterday. One of my favorite places in all the world, he says with all sarcasm. And that place right now is a festival overflowing with ornaments. It, it is gross, right? <laughs> Everywhere you can't turn, you can't move without knocking something over. And this is the word he uses here. But no, we know what an ornament is, right? It's something that you, you use to decorate, to decorate a tree, to decorate a house, to, to decorate the body with earrings and necklaces and all those kind of things. And that's actually the word he uses here. 
In fact, he uses this same word in Song of Solomon when he's, he's writing to his bride. And he says in Song of Solomon 4, 9, You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride, with a single strand of your necklace. Same word that he uses here. It's an adornment. Whatever it is, it is something that is attractive. And, and, and this is how wisdom works. This is the point not to be missed here. It makes your life compelling and appealing for all the right reasons. It's not just a, an adornment outwardly of the house, of the body, or, or anything else. It's something that makes your life compelling. That's, that's the way wisdom works. He says that if you listen to truth and position yourself under people worth hearing, then you will be clothed in wisdom, and it will be obvious and even helpful to others. We need to think about this. If if people are attracted to you for any kind of reason, we have to ask the question, why? Why? Why are people attracted in any way? What, What is it that's compelling? Proverbs will mention a lot of different things. Charm, beauty, flirtatiousness, money, business business experience, education, physical strength. What is it that, that we want to be known for? What is it that we want people to see? What is it that we want to be on display? Is it any of those things? Solomon will say all of those things are vanity. What you need to be known for is the graceful wreath, the beautiful necklace of wisdom. That's compelling. A life under the constraints and under the weight and under the joys of the Word of God. Now, that's not to say that if you pursue a life of wisdom, everyone's going to say, oh, what a wise, wonderful life. In fact, they may assess you, the unbeliever especially, will look at you and say, you're a fool. You see this in a lot of different ways. What's valuable to you and to me will will sometimes be worthless to others. You ever had something that was passed on to you maybe by a grandparent or something that you maybe you just had since childhood, and then you take a risk and you go to sell it in the next yard sale? It was, until that day, really valuable to you and and almost priceless. You you treasured it. And then you're like, well, maybe I'm going to turn it loose eventually. And I finally do. And I put it in the yard sale. and And a lady comes up to you and says, I'll give you 50 cents for it. And you're offended, right? She doesn't understand how valuable that has been to you. What's valuable to you may be worthless to others. But that's not how wisdom works. Wisdom is not subject to what the market will bear. What is the value of something? And the value of something is what somebody is, worth, is willing to pay for it, right? That's the value of something. But that's not the way wisdom works. Because having biblical wisdom, the world may say, I'll, I'll give you nothing for it. How's that? Because they don't assess it rightly. Wisdom is not subject to that. Wisdom is and always will be part of the foolishness of the gospel. And so you need to be comfortable with that. You need to be under, uh, comfortable with the fact when we talk about a payment to consider, we're not talking about uh, in, in receiving the world's applause or anything like that. We're saying this is something that will foundationally make you wise unto the Lord. It will guard your steps as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mother, as a student, as a worker, as a citizen. Embrace the means of wisdom. There's a second lesson that will help us discern our relationship to others. And here comes the warning in verses 10 through 14. Discern, think about the temptation of fools. Discern the temptations of fools. There's a few here as well. And as you start absorbing the lessons of wisdom, the call of temptation, it starts to knock on your door. It starts, to, uh, it starts banging on your door and it says, come on with us. And Solomon depicts these as sinful enticements, short-sighted promises. They cry out for you to join them. What are these? Notice the first one. Let's break this down a few ways. Verse 10, enticed by empty promises. Enticed by empty promises. Verse 10, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Sometimes the enticements come from out there. We we talk about the world, peer pressure, advertisements, cultural expectations. Other times it comes from in here, my own heart, 
John Calvin said that the, the heart is an idol factory. I mean, we just come up with all kinds of schemes and devices. Our own sinful nature says, I want all the time. But what is Solomon saying here, verse 10? In other words, think. And he's not saying this the way the world says, think for yourself. He's saying, think biblically. Think according to the instruction that's been passed on to you. And he's telling us something important. When we're complicit with fools or foolish thinking, we're not innocent bystanders. Don't consent. You're not innocent in this. Don't give your permission to go along with that. Don't consent or approve of the sinful ramblings or misdeeds of fools. He'll look at this from another angle later on in, in chapter 16, verse 29. A man of violence entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. So now in, in 1629, he's looking at it from the vantage point of those that are doing the enticing. And he says, a man of violence entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived, meaning we can be deceived about this. Bad company corrupts good morals, right? It, it corrupts good teaching. It, 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 it corrupts sound instruction when we are deceived by this. Empty promises. Enticed by empty promises. Now, how do we know that em empty promises work because advertising is trillions of dollars, it works, right? Advertising works every single day. In fact, it's just getting more and more interesting, isn't it? And in how things are advertised to us with algorithms and everything else, it's, it's frightening in some ways. Advertisements work. People also gullibly follow the same Political campaign promises that you heard four years ago and four years before that and four years before that and every two years. It's the same thing again and again. How do we know that people believe empty promises? Just look. It's everywhere. It's in every advertisement. You, you, you're promised something. I remember being promised things every Saturday morning watching cartoons. That used to be a thing. And, you, and, and, and the great thing about the cartoons were the, the advertisements that would come on. New from Mattel, right? And you would get it and its luster would be gone in about five seconds, and you're just stuck playing with the box. The box became more interesting. It's empty. It's an empty promise. It, it, it said, if you do this, this will be great. And it wasn't great. And here we have, really, the paradox of group approval. On the one hand, you're being affirmed for what you want to hear. You're being maybe even liked for what you want to hear. You're gaining followers for what you want to hear. You're gaining approval, the approval of the group for what you want to hear. But on the other hand, you're insulated from what you need to hear. That's the empty promise. Is this hypothetical? No. Uh, this actually happened to Solomon's son. Uh, in simple terms, Rehoboam didn't listen to the mature voices in his life. And in fact, he surrounded himself with youth. He surrounded himself with an affinity group, people that were just like him. And he listened to them and it brought on destruction. First Kings 12, verse 8. Listen to what it says. It's almost like a playing out of Solomon's very warning. First Kings 12, verse 8. But he forsook the counsel of the elders, which they had counseled him. And he took counsel with the young men who grew up with him and stood before him. Summary of what happens, destruction ensues. Things are never right. Things are so not right that in the same chapter, it says that Israel is divided as a kingdom to this day. Guess what? Israel is divided as a kingdom to this day. Still, don't be enticed by empty promises. Don't be enticed by those who say you're there when you're not. We've all been there. In fact, I can think of many examples. There's two women that have led me astray, and I'm going to name them right here. Alexa and Siri. Two women that will lead you astray, right? One time I was on my... Some of you are like, what? Um, <laughs> you need to get out more. But once I was out, and, and, and Siri was telling me I was going to visit a, a church member's house. This is true story. It was a new neighborhood, and it, and it said, uh, turn right, turn right, turn left, turn left, and all those kind of things, and you're bobbing and weaving, and you're, and you're making your way. And then it says, you have arrived. Problem was, is that if I would have kept going, I would have been in the middle of a field. 
And unless that church member had moved to a field and were living in a tent, which I'm pretty sure they weren't and, 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 were, and have not, I had not arrived. I had been led astray by a voice, seemingly a voice of wisdom, a voice that algorithmically, if that's a word, knows everything, right? We haven't arrived. This is the way it works. This is the way empty promises work. You've made it. This is it. This is the end. This is the pot of gold. This is all of it. They're empty promises. Solomon calls them here in verse 10 enticements. Enticements. Notice how else this plays out, uh, these temptations. Entertained, verses 11 and 12, entertained by wicked abuse. Entertained by wicked abuse. Is entertained too strong of a word? I don't think it is. It may not be strong enough. He says, verse 11, if they say to you, son, come with us. Now notice the emphasis here. Come with us. Let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole as those that go down to the pit. Turning away from the voice of wisdom, now you're listening to the us. You're listening to the, the, the group. It's group think. It's polling. It's all of these things. Entertained by wicked abuse is what's being described here. First, notice, it, it, don't miss this. They promise community. And, and it's very tempting for us in this room to look at this and say, well, that's not a world that I can understand or that I've ever lived in. This, this, is a, this is a roving gang in a third world country. Not so fast. They promise community. This could be any number of things that hold out that empty promise for you, right? It's a company. It's a club. It's a clique. It's the accepted. It's those who are in the know. Today, the word that they would use is the influencer. Whatever they are, don't miss this, they are telling you to depart from truth. Whatever they are, whoever they are, come away with us. Let us lie in wait. We will ambush them. We're in the driver's seat. We're in control. And they're actually not, as we'll see. They are entangled and, and entertained, possibly, by what's going on here in these verses. This is like a game for them. What's described here is, is wicked abuse. It's, it's more than that. Uh, even he uses the word blood here, which is a, a euphemism for murder. Th this is the ultimate here. They're, they're lying in wait to kill others. He describes it here in wicked terms. It's premeditated behavior that, and don't miss this, to, to prey upon the innocent and the unsuspecting. That's what it does. Because it's very easy for us to say, well, that's not me. I don't do that. But it is preying upon the innocent and the unsuspecting. He uses that phrase there, innocent blood. You see this also in the kings that would come after Solomon in 2 Kings 21. King Manasseh, who became king at the ripe old age of 12. You know that's not going to go good, right? King Manasseh used and shed he says, innocent blood. Uh, note that word innocent there in verse 11. It's in the original, it's singular. And then he shifts to the plural, them, let us swallow them, plural. So what he's saying here, he moves from an isolated event to a, an ongoing series of events. Th this is a way of life. This is characteristic. This is a pattern. It's not isolated. This characterizes their life. This characterizes fools. They take advantage of the weak and the innocent. Now, again, it's easy to look at verses 11 and 12 and think this is a roving gang and this is happening far removed from the life and the people that I know, right? Maybe, maybe not, but probably so. Maybe people hearing this are thinking, well, I'm not a violent aggressor and that, that may be the case. And I hope it is. However, as Jesus might say, we're here today, don't strain out a bullet and catch a mortar round, right? We, we can say, I'm not that, but I haven't thought about these other aspects. What is the spirit of this verse? It, it's this. It is empty nihilism that seeks to take advantage of others. What does this look like? Let me give you some examples. These are things that I've heard Christians, professing Christians, sit in my office and talk about and confess and things that I've read about and things that I've seen in other churches and all sorts of things. Scams. Those who take advantage of the weak and vulnerable. Those who take advantage of children or widows. Those who knowingly sell a fraudulent product. 
blackmail, abusers, physical, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, schemers, those who seek to dominate others through intimidation, threats, beatings, sexual assault, physical coercion, sleep deprivation, forced starvation, confinement, financial manipulation, seeking to control someone, withholding needed care or provisions. You get the picture? This is, this is far more entangled. It's those, he says here, who ambush the innocent without just reason, without cause, without reason. That word that he uses there is without cause or without reason. It's literally someone who's a false witness, someone who's a liar and, and takes advantage of other people in that way. Proverbs 24, verse 28, don't be a witness against your neighbor without cause. Don't be a false witness. What he's talking about here are those whose, whose values become corrupted and entangled in such a way, they become perverted, and so you start to call what is evil good, right? Isaiah warned against this. Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Don't be entertained by those things either. We are a culture that is entertained by violence, by pain of others, by the beating down of the weak. What else? Let her see. Ensnared by selfish greed. Verses 13 and 14. Verse 13. We, listen to their voice again. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. This is what they promise. We will fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your towel with us. Throw in your lot with us. Come with us. We shall all have one purse. We'll share in the riches together. Another false promise. Foolishness, foolish thinking, gives us the appearance, listen carefully, of security. It gives us the appearance of security. It gives us the false hope of security. That's what it does. That's what greed does. The friends, notice they promise something. Wealth, spoil, luxury will be set. We'll have generational wealth, they might even say. Again, this may seem like a gang in a third world country. We don't identify with this. But what might this look like today? I'm glad you asked. It looks like insider trading, manipulating financial reports, skirting local and federal laws for your business. Gambling, following so-called get-rich schemes, consumed with always making more. It's, it's anything that is built on the exploitation of others or driven by the sin of covetousness that erodes a biblical work ethic and a responsible stewardship. It's, it's anything that falls under that. And Solomon is going to come to that over and over and over again. This is just the introduction. What he has here, what, he, what is promised here, is the dark side of easy money and empty promises. Later, he'll, he'll, he'll flip all of this around. Is it all negative? No, it's not all negative. There's a lot of wonderful things, a lot of wonderful teaching in Proverbs. Solomon's going to talk about the goodness and the nobility of gainful employment. He's going to talk about what it means to uh, have a godly, faithful inheritance that you leave for others. He's talking about patiently investing wisely. There's a lot of, of insight from Proverbs on these things, but here he's approaching it from the negative. Because don't think that you will be able to master Solomon's wise investing tips if you haven't dealt with selfish greed at the root. Jesus said this could actually be our undoing. He says in Luke 9, 25, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? You can have all of it. One last thing here we want to see in beginning of verse 15. Avoid the path of fools. This is the last lesson to the son here. Avoid the path of fools. Just don't even go there. What does the path of fools look like? It, it looks a, a couple of things here we want to note. One is it's quick and it's easy. It's, it's easy. What does Jesus say? Wide is the road. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. It's an easy path. It's lazy, quick and easy. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path. Their feet run to evil. They hasten. They're quick to shed blood. 
Now, the way here, this is an important word, the way here is more than just the wrong place. It even includes the consequences of going and pursuing the wrong way. It's all that goes with that. The, the Psalms will address, use the same word, both from the negative standpoint and the positive standpoint. Let me show you a couple of things. Just listen to this. Psalm 1, verse 1, you probably know Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. He's, he's describing the full-orbed aspect of the way of the fool, right? His walk is with the wicked. He stands with sinners. He sits with, with scoffers. That's a negative approach. Positively, we see the, the value of not going that way. Psalm 26, verse 3. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of the evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about your altar, O Yahweh. There has to be a, a, a negative understanding that if I go in certain places, I'm a fool. There also has to be the positive enforcement of, of just knowing that I do not want to sin against the Lord. I want to honor the Lord with, my, with not only my words, but with my walk. Psalm 17, verse 4, As for the deeds of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept from the paths of the violent. It's quick and it's easy. They run to evil. They hasten to shed blood. Lastly, notice that it's also useless and lifeless. This is the path of fools. It's useless and lifeless. Verse 17, Indeed, it is useless to spread the baited net in the sight of any bird. Birds are dumb. Now, birds are smart on one level as birds go, but they're dumb compared to humans, right? Solomon is saying, here's something that's so obvious even a bird can see it. They don't fly into that kind of trap. Instead, he said, these, these foolish companions, verse 18, they lie and wait for their own blood and they ambush their own lives. Useless in verse 17, lifeless in verse 18. You see it? Paul says, by way of application, 1 Timothy 6, 9, those who want to get rich, they fall into a temptation and a snare, an ambush. They ambush their own life. They snare their own life. They lie in wait for their own blood. That, that's the sad reality of all of this. We're going to go do destruction, and we're going to gain by that, but actually they're defeating themselves in the end. Verse 19, now I'm, I'm reading from the New American Standard, and it says this, so are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. That's, a, that's an implication of this. That's an application also of this. It takes away the life of its possessors, but that's not exactly what Solomon is saying here. If you're reading from the ESV or the Legacy Standard, verse 19 says, So are the paths of everyone who is greedy for gain. That's, the, that's what Solomon says here. Ultimately, this is not about roving in gangs. This is about being greedy. Not just gaining by violence. In the end, they're crushed by all that they worked for, all that they stored up, all that they hoarded. It takes the life of its possessors. It's lifeless. Greed takes life while under the delusion of the good life. That's the sad reality. The path of fools, we're starting to see it here, and it'll come into view, or it's often filled with many possessions, with great abundance, but, but these things are soul-destroying. Unless, unless... Unless you think, well, I've got a lot of stuff, but I'm the exception to all the warnings of Scripture. Right? We always think that, don't we? Well, if I got a chance to have that, I would be different. Here's what Paul says to the rich. Now, some of you are going to immediately tune me out because you're like, I don't have $2 to rub together, so I know I'm not rich. That's not who the Apostle Paul is speaking to here. Let's put it this way. Relatively speaking, if you know where your next meal is coming from, where you're going to sleep tonight, and you have gainful employment or education, you're very wealthy as far as the world is concerned. So he's talking to us. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. Instruct those who are rich. That's all of us. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous 
ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. The path of fools is the opposite of that. And it will always keep us from being wise. The more we grow in our own resources, the more we grow in our own wisdom, the more we grow in our own way, the less dependent we are on all that is in God. The more we stack up, the more we hoard, the more we expand. The temptations are there. Don't take my word for it. Take it from Scripture. They're there, and they're waiting for you to ensnare you. Proverbs teaches us a better way. Not greed, but generosity. Now, we're going to come back to all of this, right? But, but here's what we all might be thinking. Where we're, we're talking about fatherhood or motherhood or we're talking about being a, a youth and, and you're hearing other voices that are influencing you in life and school and all sorts of other things. Or maybe you're saying, yep, that's my heart. It's a greedy heart. I need help and I need wisdom. That should be the cry of all of us. I want to show you some good news here and we're going to come back to this next week. Look down at verse 23. What should you do? If that's the cry of your heart, verse 23, turn to my reproof. Behold, look at this. I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. You know what he's talking about? To the unbeliever, he's talking about conversion. If you're without Christ and the hope of Christ, you need Jesus. You, you, don't, you don't just need to turn over a new leaf. You don't need to say, I'm going to stop being greedy. I'm going to start being generous. No. Because you can be generous all the way to hell. You need Christ. You need a new heart. You need His Spirit poured out within you. This is the imagery of conversion. And not only that, God doesn't just save us and then leave us. For the believer, He continues to do this. He continues to pour out His Spirit. He continues to guard us and guide us and strengthen us so that you can say no to those influences and you can say yes to godliness and pleasing the Lord. That's good news. What do you need to do? Turn to his reproof. Listen, listen. Listen with a humble, teachable heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to do what the text has called us to do, to listen, to hear, to hear your word. We admit these are strong words from Solomon's pen. But Lord, help us not excuse us because of how we might view Solomon. Because ultimately, this came from you. And it's your word for us today. And we pray that we would be shaped and molded and changed by it. Lord, I do pray for the husbands and fathers of our church. That they would just be a class of humble servants to their homes and to our church. That they would love people. That they would love the sheep. That they would love their own homes. They love their own children and wives in a way that reflects Christ. We pray for the dear mothers and wives and women of this church. You would strengthen them as well. So many demands, so many undue, sinful, worldly expectations placed upon them. And we pray, Lord, that they would just cultivate the wonderful godliness that is seen in the quiet place and not always appreciated by the world, if rarely. We pray that you would strengthen them in this church. We pray for the youth of this church, that you would help them depart from the path of wickedness, that those young men and women that are on the path of not becoming but are fools, we pray that you would open their hearts, you would help them see the wisdom of Christ, the love of Christ, and the sacrifice of Christ for them to rescue them from their evil way. We pray for those that are following you, those students that are young and still impressionable and yet they love Christ with all their heart. We pray that you would embolden them and strengthen them. We pray that they would stand strong and be firm even in a campus of darkness and a world of darkness. We pray that you would encourage their hearts. Father, we ask all of this knowing that we are helpless and so we ask, Lord, that you would help us turn our ears to wisdom only because of what Christ has done for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you leave, let me mention a couple of things to you. Just a couple of a quick announcements here. One is on December 10th, there will be a baptism class. Uh, that will take place during the Sunday school hour at 10 a.m. Uh, in the seminary room, the TES room down the hall. If you have questions about what is baptism, what it's not, why do we do it, 
Uh, do I need it? Those kind of things. And there's no obligation, truth in advertising, right? There's no obligation where you, you don't have to be baptized uh, by going to this class. This is a, a fact-finding mission to study Scripture and understand what it is and what it means and whether you should be baptized or not. Uh, so that will be the baptism class on December 10th. Please uh, note that and come to that if, if you need to. Also, we need some more volunteers for our usher team. This is for men and women in our church. It's open to either. Uh, as we have gone to two services, we have a greater need uh, spanning across those uh, two different hours there. And so we need some help there. If you're able to help with this or want any information about any of these things, you can go to the information desk there in the foyer. All right, let's stand together as we close and hear our benediction. Listen to the words from John, the Apostle, 1 John 2, 5. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. And all God's people said, Amen. You're dismissed.